I'm Betty Swan, and welcome to our show, Wisdom in the Night, where you get help for the tough decisions in your life. Tonight, I have a great guest. She is a political analyst, former Miss America, and an eating disorder advocate. Welcome, Kirsten Hagland. Hi. Thank you for being on the show. This is going to be a very, not only interesting, I feel like deeply helpful maybe more than any show I've done so far. Well, thank so you. So I'm, I'm eager to know all about you. Kind of tell me about your background. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, um, in a nutshell, I was uh, born and raised in Michigan, so I'm a Midwest girl at heart outside of the Detroit area, and I grew up as a ballet dancer. Uh, I was devoted to the performing arts as a young girl, absolutely loved to dance. I sang with my family in church and um, took voice lessons, was involved in drama. That was kind of my whole world. But in the pursuit of a ballet career, which, as I'm sure you can imagine, is a just a very, very difficult, competitive world. Uh, it can be toxic at times, and there's a very, very thin body ideal in that world. Um, and just the pressure uh, really just kind of took a toll on me. And when I was about 12 years old, um, that was when I started to first struggle with an eating disorder. And it was kind of a culmination of factors, not just the ballet world, but also at that age, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. And I had an older brother who started to struggle with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. And so my formerly happy little life just kind of started to crumble down around me. And really, in, in my eyes, the only way to have any control over that chaos was to just throw myself headfirst into achieving the thing that was really giving me my identity at that point. And the that dancing, was ballet. ballet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, um, and that was at the age of 12? At 12 years old. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And um, so, I, I mean, I didn't set out one day and wake up and decide, oh, I'm going to have an eating disorder. No, of course it not. It just was this slow coalescing into really starvation mode. And, now, it yeah. was a coalescing into the starvation mode. Did you tell yourself, I look at other bodies that are dancers and mine doesn't quite match perfection or what? Well, it's a combination of things. Um, it's far from that um, simple. But partially, yeah, at 12 years old, your body is changing and there's hormones and, <laughs> you know, you're comparing yourself. And what's interesting is I look back now with healthy eyes to pictures of myself as a 12-year-old girl before I started struggling with my eating disorder. And it just blows my mind that I could possibly think that I was fat or overweight at that age. Um, but, you know, part of it was a drive for thinness to look like professional dancers that I saw in the dance magazines that I read and the videos mm -hmm. that I watched. Mm -hmm. But also controlling food and controlling my exercise and you know, my weight was a way to have something in my purview that I could control when everything else around me was out of my control. You could control how much you ate mm -hmm. and how much you exercised. Yep. And it gave me a tangible goal. You know, I'm a very left brain person. Two plus two equals four. You know, I like things rigid. I like things in a schedule. You know, I like being able to put in the work and getting a certain result. Mm -hmm. And to me, calorie counting and, and weight management and all of that was a way that I could see things that I were doing that were contributing to a result that I wanted. But that was the that's the big lie of the eating disorder, that it tells you that if you put this work in and this effort in, you'll be thin and you'll be happy. And that's just obviously a total lie because the goalposts keep moving. You never get thin enough. You never have enough control. You never feel perfect enough or light enough, and you're never able to please enough people, because so much of it, too, is about admiration and love because of the positive response that I got from dance teachers and from, you know, men that I would partner with, you know, because what they're always they lifting say? you. You're so light. Oh, it's you're easy. so light. You're so beautiful. Um, you know, you'd get certain roles. You'd get promoted. I mean, it's because you're looking more and more like a beautiful, ethereal ballerina, mm -hmm. you know? A and princess. So, yeah, a, a princess, a fairy, an angel. I mean, it sounds silly and girlish maybe to some people who might be listening, but in the ballet world, I mean, that is that is the, the pinnacle. Um, now, thankfully, 
in the last couple of years, there's been a real push toward more body diversity in the dance field, which is amazing and, and much needed. But there's still um, a real rigidity there. And it's not just to the rigidity of one body ideal. It's also just the emotional suppression and the push past the level of pain. Um, you know, whoever can, you know, push themselves the hardest is the one that, that makes it. You know, it's all this denial of self, denial of needs, denial of hunger, denial of pain in order to achieve perfection and elite, you know, being an elite. Well, now, can someone be an elite without doing all of that or do they have to do yeah. that? No, they can. They absolutely can. How would you have done it differently? <laughs> well, I don't think, I mean, God directs our paths and God allows us to struggle and suffer with things. Um, to bring out other qualities. Yes, and to grow us and to teach us dependence on Him. And so I can't imagine my life going any differently. I mean, obviously, I didn't want to struggle with an eating disorder. Um, if I could, you know, look back, I would have, you know, just focused more on my technique and focused more on being the best dancer that I could be rather than trying to lose weight or fit, in, fit a perfect image. You know, and there's still days, I mean, I live very close to Lincoln Center in New York City, and so I live right across from where the New York City Ballet and American Ballet Theater mm -hmm. and countless world-class ballet companies come to perform. And, you know, I watch them with joy and also a little bit of sadness because I think maybe what my life could have been like if I didn't, you know, if I didn't struggle with this. But God has me on a different path now, and I'm very thankful for the ways that he met me in the middle of that struggle because I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have have the faith that I do now. Right. Well, now, do only young girls struggle with an eating disorder, or is it men, children, boys? Yeah, you know, um, there are a lot of myths surrounding eating disorders, and I think they really came to greater public awareness with, sadly, um, unfortunately, the death of Karen Carpenter mm -hmm. um, in the 1970s. That and was a shock. Do you remember how shocked? It was. Well, I mean, I don't personally remember. Oh, because you're too young. <laughs> I wish but I, I remember because I, I see I pictures could, of yeah. it and I go, yeah. my gosh, she was a skeleton Yeah, and right at the end. Yes. And, you know, just incredibly tragic because she was so talented. Mm -hmm. um, but... You know, for for the good that that did for the cause and that it brought more awareness to it, obviously it's so sad that someone had to die in order for that to happen. At the same time, um, you know, there's still a lot of myths that persist, one of which is that it, you know, an eating disorder looks only one way, that someone's only sick when they look very, very thin, like Car a Karen Carpenter did or like so many celebrities that we see covered in the tabloids. Um, actually, most people that suffer or actually sadly pass away from this illness are usually at a normal weight or, or overweight um, in some cases. My because, um, you know, each body type is so different. And so someone can be at an anorexic weight or experiencing anorexic symptoms and not look to the naked eye like they are, you know, very, very emaciated. Um, at the same time, actually, more people struggle with bulimia, which doesn't always result in weight loss, than do anorexia. Um, and actually, binge eating disorder is the most common eating disorder that exists. Um, and that affects more of a proportionate amount of males and females. Of course, that's binging without purging, which can be, you know, vomiting, exercise. And there are multiple different ways to purge. Um, also, uh, men as well as eating disorder, um, as well as women struggle very seriously, actually. And for a long time, just men had been so stigmatized and didn't feel like they could really come out and share their struggles. Um, so now more are starting to feel more comfortable sharing mm -hmm. those battles. And so we're starting to see more reporting. So yeah, it really yeah, is do you see, a wide variety uh, of people. What kind of men? Uh, military men? Uh, people under pressure? Yeah, what? you know, um, much like, I mean, people, um, you know, women that are in high risk fields where there's, you know, it's very image focused, obviously. Models, actors and actresses, uh, figure skaters, ballet dancers are often, you know, long distance runners are more likely to struggle. But in no way is that saying that it's just those people. Um, and that is something that you find in men as well. It's men that are involved in weightlifting, especially because they have to, you know, go up or drop weight to mm -hmm. be in a certain weight class. Mm -hmm. um, long distance runners, um, you know, a lot of young men that um, come back from serving in the military, they're suffering with trauma. PTSD, and this is a way that, you know, that 
acts itself out or manifests itself. Is that how they uh, deal with the PTSD by controlling their lack of eating or yeah, I mean, for immense, every, immense ec, uh, exercise? What? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for for every person, it's so different. Oh, okay. But it can be, you know. Um, getting into a routine with exercise and with weight loss. Um, it can be the need to act out with in binging and purging. Um, you know, also acting out can include substance abuse problems, um, opioid addiction, uh, rage and aggression, you know, um, and bulimia or binge eating disorder can be another way of acting out. Mm -hmm. um, it, anorexia can, can be focused on control. You know, every person is is so different, and biology plays a role in this too, as well. Um, actually, what do you mean by biology? Well, usually they find research shows that these kind of issues run in families. So, you know, my mother struggled with depression. My older brother struggled with OCD. You know, I struggled with an eating disorder. And so often, um, you know, the personality traits that are common to someone developing some of these issues chronically um, are things that are passed down from generation well, to now, generation. Well, now, I've also heard that sexual abuse can bring it about. Have you Absolutely. done any study on that? Or? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, <laughs> there's so much research out there that points to the fact that trauma, whether it's in childhood or, or later, um, whether it's rape, sexual abuse, um, trauma, as we mentioned with men and women that serve in our military, um, it can be a traumatic accident, a traumatic death in the family. Those kinds of experiences, usually if the person is not able to get good counseling, good treatment, mm -hmm. um, you know, to work through and really process that trauma, mm -hmm. then that individual is going to stuff those down or suppress those emotions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're going to manifest themselves later in life, whether it's through an addiction or an eating disorder or, you know, something else. And that's so why treatment is so important. So how did you get out so of it? Um, <laughs> through really, really hard work. Um, you know, there's no overnight fix to dealing with any of these issues. And so, um, you know, thankfully, I was 15 at the time that my parents forced me to get help. I mean, I was an adolescent, thankfully, at that time, so they could, you know, really for force me to go. Uh, and I got set up with an outpatient treatment team of doctors, which included a pediatric eating disorder specialist, a psychologist, and a nutritionist in order to kind of come at the illness from all three sides, both mm -hmm. the mental, the physical, and the spiritual. And so, um, you know, I was going to these doctors multiple times a week for two years, um, really working on not only weight restoration, um, and, you know, I had to get my menstruation back. I mean, I totally lost my period for three and a half years. As a young um, girl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I lost um, a good percent of my, my bone density. I was actually had osteopenia, which is the precursor to osteoporosis as a teenager. And um, so thankfully, I was able to, to get most of that bone density back, recovered, um, but then also working, you know, with a nutritionist on a meal plan, learning how to eat again, learning how to cook for myself. And um, that was a real educational experience, but um, a good one. And now I love to cook. And then working with the psychologist and um, my, my faith community on the emotional underpinnings of the disorder because it's really it's really about so much more than food and weight. It sounds like it's very detailed and yeah. very intricate. You know, for me it was in my my body shape and size and my perfectionism, you know, my drive mm -hmm. for perfectionism. For some people it's you know, being the life of the party and doing whatever that means to be that, you know, right. what, what are we finding our identity in? And at the end of the day, um, you can pursue and pursue and pursue those things, but they never really fulfill you. You know, I'd like for you to look in the camera right now. Mm -hmm. I believe there's somebody watching this show that is keying in and wishing you would talk to them. So do you mind just taking a second and look in the camera? Yeah. There's somebody listening. I promise you. Yeah. Go sure. ahead. Um, well, first of all, hi. <laughs> um, I guess I just want to let you know that you're not alone in this battle. Whatever it is you might be fighting, whether it's an eating disorder or dissatisfaction with yourself or just a real longing for um, self-worth and purpose and meaning. And I, I want you to know, first of all, that you're not alone, that you are so worth it to God, that He just loves you so much. And one thing that I really had to learn when I was in recovery from this is that, you know, there was nothing that I could do to earn God's love. Um, but that also means that there was nothing that I could do to lose his love. Nothing that I did in the past, nothing that I was struggling with in the moment, and nothing that I could ever do in the future, which he already knew about. And so that love is not earned, and there's nothing you can do to lose it. And I just want you to hold on to that um, 
And also know that it's okay to reach out for help. Um, there might be some people that maybe don't understand, but there are people that do. And so don't be afraid to reach out for help because you can't get through this on your own. This isn't a life phase. This isn't, a, there's nothing that is gonna solve it quickly. Um, this is something where you need and deserve um, professional help, whether that's a counselor or um, a therapist or someone in your life that you trust. Um, it's okay to reach out for help. It really is. It doesn't mean you're weak. It makes, means you're strong and that life um, really can exist outside of an eating disorder, that full freedom from this issue is, is totally possible. Wow. Now, how did you get a close walk with the Lord? Because I can tell you keep referring to your faith, your, your faith friends, your... Yeah. I, I, like, do you walk with Jesus? Do you know Jesus? <laughs> do you what? Yes, I love Jesus. Um, <laughs> Me too. He is my fave. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I was born and raised in a Christian household, but I, my faith really didn't become my own until this struggle. I mean, I went to church every Sunday and I hung out with my youth group friends, but it didn't really mean very much to me mm -hmm. and um, just kind of saw God as up there in the clouds somewhere. And then it was when I reached this like black pit of despair in the just the horrors of... Um, my eating disorder that I realized that I couldn't do life on my own, that I was really totally powerless over myself. And even though I thought I was in control, I would just was so completely That must have been a low feeling when you got to the place of, I am not in control. It's just, I am powerless. Yeah. Did you feel that way? I mean, it's just the blackest emptiness you can experience, um, not only mentally, but also physically because mm -hmm. you are just so empty. And then after trying for six months to do recovery by myself and realizing I was also failing at that, um, just really drove me back to um, my Bible. And I hadn't opened a Bible since my confirmation class. I mean, I really didn't think there was anything in there for me. And I opened it to the Psalms and I just started reading and I just That's started the middle crying. of the Bible. Yeah. yeah, I just started bawling because there are these beautiful songs and they just totally 100% expressed what mm -hmm. was on my heart. Mm -hmm. I mean, I thought it's I was going to open the isn't Bible. It? it was actually like literally unbelievable because I'm thinking you took the words right out of my mouth. And so, you know, that was not some great theological revelation, but it was comfort for me in that time. Mm -hmm. And especially Psalm 139. So if anyone has a Bible out there or you're in a hotel room and there's the Gideon's Google, Bible. You can Google it. Shoot, Google it. <laughs> <laughs> Google it. Google Psalm 139 because it is just so unbelievably ama amazing. It's my favorite. Um, but that was what really drew me back in. And so on just days where I couldn't make sense of anything else, I would just pick up my Bible and start reading. And um, that's what drew my heart back to the Lord. And I just started praying over everything and just praying and asking God for help because there was literally nothing else that I knew how to do. And that was what led me to a living faith and just deeper and deeper dependence on God. And, you know, it didn't mean that my life became perfect. I mean, I still have bad days and I still have relationship issues and I still, you know, have, you know, problems in my life just like anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that I don't have to go through it alone. And that is just the most wonderful comfort it makes. It rounds out the edges of life so that they're not so hard. And we live in Manhattan. It's a hard city, mm -hmm. and um, it makes the bumps and bruises of life just a little bit softer. Just to have the Lord to lean on. Absolutely. It's beautiful. So I do have to ask you, how in the world did you get to be <laughs> Miss America? Oh, I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, it was totally the Lord. I mean, that's just the answer. Um, because I planned on going to college after, you know, after spending two years hard work and recovery, you know, making a long story very short mm -hmm. um, because it, it's a super hard process. Um, I just, I got the okay from my doctors to go to college. I was going to go to school for musical theater performance, so I would still stay in the performing arts. And in order to do that, I, um, you know, wanted to earn some extra scholarship money. And I knew some women who'd competed in the Miss America organization and had won some scholarship. And so I thought, oh, I'll just do that. I'll be a breeze. You know, I've been performing on stage all my life. So getting on stage and walking around in an evening gown and singing, you know, my talent, well, shouldn't be a big deal. Um, and so I just entered a local competition in Michigan and I was 17 years old. I wore pantyhose for the first time in my life in that interview, you know, because you have a 10 minute interview with the judges beforehand. I felt totally awkward and out of my realm, uh, but I won. I won that local pageant. 
So I thought, okay, so I had to go to school, spent my freshman year at college, coming back on the weekends, doing Miss Oakland County appearances, had to go to state. I went to Miss Michigan, also had zero plans of doing anything, and I won Miss Michigan. Now, how did you win that? <laughs> I, honestly, Betty, that's what I'm telling you. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Um, I just, honestly, all, all I can say is that God wanted me there. And so I, I won Miss Michigan, and I went to Miss America six months later, standing on stage in Las Vegas, and I won Miss America. Now, what so, did that feel I like? You know, know you see them. Happened. They all do this thing right like this, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and I did. what do you feel like I on did. the inside? Wait, first of all, it's what does it like, feel like when you're waiting? The top three, yeah. you're standing there. What are you thinking? Yeah, it's just bizarre. You're, you're, you just have no thoughts. Oh, okay. It's, it's just like you're in your blank because, you know, okay. there's the hot TV lights on you and there's, you know, the crowd is going crazy and, and you're this dead silence and the music like, dun, 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 you know, it's intense. I mean, you just can't think about anything. You just, your fate is in the hands of these seven judges, you know, and God, if, if you know, that's what you believe. And I do. So, but you know, what is really, um, Interesting. I mean, just going into that whole week, I was just totally at peace. Like, I felt totally at peace with whatever happened because I didn't go into it ever thinking that I would win. Um, and I knew that whatever was going to happen was what was supposed to happen. And so, honestly, I didn't feel nervous. I didn't feel anxious. I didn't have any because I hadn't poured, you know, my life into. And some have. I know because I know other people that have committed, uh, competed for Miss America. Yeah. And it can be as stressful as what you were talking about yeah. back when you were 12. It, you know, it really can. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is, um, you know, that made it a very freeing experience mm -hmm. for me. I mean, it did now looking back, you know, I feel bad that in some ways that it was that simple for me because I know so many girls do devote. Well, yeah, but so you probably have a challenge it. somewhere else. You, know? you never know. You oh, know? Absolutely. <laughs> now, how did, absolutely. Now, how did you get into being a TV analyst? What? Yeah. How did that happen? So I have always, since I was a young girl, just had a heart for history and current events and what's going on in the world. And I think that's part of being raised by a father who is always engaged in that and you know like i said raised in a christian home where you're always talking about what's going on in the world and you know trying to get to the deeper questions of why you know why do people do what they do why is what what's happening in the world happening and so i always grew up with a love for that and a deep intellectual curiosity um, directed in that way and then after my years miss america my dreams of entertainment and all that kind of went out the window because i started to, you know, advocate and speak on the issues of eating disorders and mental health generally and, you know, got involved in so much great charity work. And I just thought, you know, I want to have my own voice. And so I switched. I loved doing media. And so I when I went back to school, I went to Emory University in Atlanta and I graduated with a degree in political science and studied journalism there as well. And just really loved the idea of working in an environment where you can tell people's stories, um, share human stories, um, try to, to shed a light and on some of the positive things that are going on in this world, which I know can be difficult at times, but um, really just led me to a love of, of speaking the truth and advocating for people who don't have a platform and a voice to share their story and their experiences. Um, and then I've done you know work on Capitol Hill with the mental health community, with grassroots lobbying groups, trying to make a difference and an impact uh, on Capitol Hill there with our legislators. And so that's um, that's what drove me to to TV. And yeah. I now, what it. what all have you been on on TV? What stations? What networks? What? Oh boy, uh, everywhere. <laughs> a little bit of everything. Um, I do Fox News Channel, Fox Business Network, um, CNN, CNN International, MSNBC. So every day is is different. And so you don't work for shows a particular network. You are you right? You're I'm roving. <laughs> okay. I, I rove. And do you have an agent, and the agent gets you in, or yeah, how does that I do happen? Have an agent. I do have an agent, and it's relationships that I have built with the networks and producers over the last, you know, since 2009. So um, they think of you, yeah, they call you when they're thinking about doing something. They yep. say, call Kirsten. Yeah. Is yeah. that how they do it? Yeah, basically. And, you know, I'm on a couple different shows on a regular schedule every week or every couple of weeks. And what are those? Yeah, they know. Um, oh, gosh. Um, Mornings with Marie on Fox Business News, um, FBN AM. Um, I'm going to be on Fox News Specialist. This is the new show on Fox News coming up here. Um, I do either The Point with Ari Melber or AM Joy every weekend on MSNBC. 
um, making money with Charles Payne every Friday. I mean, so. So a, a <laughs> lot of it is political, but it's also financial? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I'm usually on to discuss politics. I do the business network. Usually they like to have, you know, someone talking business and someone talking politics because politics affects the markets. Everything. Quite a bit. E more, than, so. more than ever. <laughs> yes. More than ever. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Now, what kind of challenges have you encountered? I know we've heard this horrible one that you survived and thrived in yeah. and turned into a wonderful thing. Oh, but you. do you have challenges now? Oh, I mean, every day. <laughs> We all have challenges, right? I mean, just being being married is a challenge You're in and married. of itself. Yes, I've been married five years. Oh, um, so you know, and uh, my husband is amazing, but you know, being married is not easy. No. You know, so that's um, in and of itself. What's every the greatest day. piece of advice you would give somebody at how to last five years? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Now, a lot of people don't even make it to that. Yeah. Um, you know, and also in the grand scheme of things, I realize we've been married a very short time compared to, you know, people who've been married 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, you know, I think the most important thing is to, oh gosh, I mean, there's, there's so many great ones. Um, but I mean, communication is so vitally important. And when I say communication, I mean be not bad communication. <laughs> My ballet True. teacher always used to say, practice doesn't make perfect, practice makes permanent. So if you practice bad communication, meaning only small talk and really never getting into the nitty gritty of your lives with one another, you're never going to have a deeper relationship um, and you're never going to get to the hard things of life. So when you do hit a rough patch, that foundation of trust um, isn't there. And there's no way to communicate because you haven't developed the yes. communication. That's yes. what you're really saying, right? Yes. And, and, then, um, and then also I would say, like, don't forget to be nice. Um, usually we're so nice to people, you know, if you're going to a networking event or you're showing up s at speaking or, you know, if you walk into the office, you're used to the pleasantries and, you know, being nice for your work people. And then you go home and you give your spouse the leftovers mm -hmm. <laughs> and that happens fly a lot. really well, you know, it's yeah. like the pleasantries. Thank you for doing that. Hey, how are you? I mean, just the small things of make kindness. such a big difference. Yeah. So folks, do you hear this? <laughs> are you learning a lot from somebody that you're looking at and thinking, she is so beautiful. And yet you're hearing all that she's gone through. But what is the common thread? I've been listening to her saying, what's the common thread? The common thread in this woman is she finds a way to overcome and she doesn't try to do it by herself. Are you trying to do yours by yourself? Did you hear her say, don't be ashamed to ask for help. It's out there. Look for the ones that have the answer. So thank you so much for tuning in tonight. It wasn't an accident that you turned on the TV, and I hope you received some wisdom and that you have a great rest of the night, whether you're going to sleep or you're going to work. I'll see you next time. Bye.